Good morning. This is Marshall Davis. Recently, during my daily devotions, I have been reading a chapter from the Indian spiritual classic, the Bhagavad Gita. Each morning, I read a chapter from the Bible. This year, I'm planning to go through all the Hebrew prophets. Right now, I'm reading Isaiah. And then after that, I read another spiritual book. Right now, that happens to be Thich Nhat Hanh's Living Buddha, Living Christ. And recently, I've added to that regimen a chapter from the Gita. As a Christian, with a non-dual approach, it's natural for me to read from scriptures of other religions that also connect and express non-duality. I've loved the Tao Te Ching, for example, and the Upanishads for a long time. I've also read Buddhist sutras. I've also read the Quran, although I have a harder time connecting the Quran to, to non-dual awareness. Personally, I, I first came in contact with the Bhagavad Gita while in college. It was around 1970 or so, and a group of devotees of the Hare Krishna movement were visiting our campus and I got into a discussion with one of them and in time I was offered a copy of the Bhagavad Gita as it is, which is a translation by their leader along with a, uh, a commentary. And I read it and I kept it for a long time. I studied the Gita again in seminary when I was exploring the different world religions, but I haven't read it much since then. So I thought it was about time to buy a new translation and explore it again. So I purchased Stephen Mitchell's new translation. His edition of the Tao Te Ching is my favorite, so I was eager to see how he approached this beloved Indian scripture. So for this episode, and maybe another one, I haven't decided yet, I want to explore and share some insights about Christian non-duality that have come from reading the Bhagavad Gita. For those of you unfamiliar with the Gita, it is a conversation between the Indian warrior Arjuna and his charioteer, who is actually Krishna, an incarnation of God. Arjuna is about to go into battle against some of his kinsmen when he has a crisis of conscience. He doesn't want to fight and kill. At that point, Krishna starts up a dialogue with Arjuna, attempting to persuade him to fulfill his duty as a member of the warrior caste and go into battle. This conversation is the substance of of the Gita, which itself is part of the larger epic, the Mahabharata. During the conversation, Krishna explains various ways that one comes to know God. He speaks about the true nature of reality and God and human beings. As I talk about the Gita today, I want to paint with a broad brush. I want to deal with three overarching themes that make up the framework of the Gita. Each of them can be described in terms of a picture in the mind's eye, at least they're a picture in my mind's eye as I was reading it. The first picture is that of the chariot. The second is the battlefield before the battle begins with the chariots in the clearing between these two opposing armies. And the third is Arjuna and Krishna in the chariot having a discussion on the subject of war. So first is a picture of Arjuna and Krishna in the chariot. I read that opening scene of the Gita and it pictured in my, my mind immediately Plato's allegory of the chariot. Plato says a human being is like a charioteer driving a chariot pulled by two horses. He says one horse is light and one is dark, one is good, one is bad, one is rational, one is emotional, one is mortal, the other is immortal. This obviously is a picture of duality. 
And he says the charioteer is the self who's trying to manage and to drive these opposing forces. And the charioteer's destination and his allegory is the realm of forms, which in Plato's philosophy is the eternal. <clears throat> that is what the Western understanding of the nature of human beings is based upon. And what struck me immediately about the Gita is that here in the Bhagavad Gita's picture is another person in the chariot. In the chariot is the Arjuna who is a human being and he represents humans, but he's not the one doing the driving. The chariot is driven by the charioteer who is Krishna, the incarnation of God. In other words, we think that we as these little mortal selves are in control of life, but we're not. We think that we're the ones driving our lives, driving the chariot, which is our body and our emotions and even our intellect but we're not. God is in control. We, as the ego or the personal self, are just along for the ride. And that becomes very clear once you realize at some point in your life, hopefully, that you're not a self, that the self itself is illusory. So there's nobody there that could possibly drive the chariot anyway, besides for the one the whole. In the Gita, Krishna says that he is the true self in every person. Krishna says, I am the self, Arjuna, seated in the heart of all beings. That means that he is Arjuna's true self. So the psyche can think it's in control and give all the commands it wants, but the charioteer runs the show. All we have to do is realize this and admit that we do not have the reins of life in our hands. The second picture is a scene on the battlefield. The two armies are lined up facing each other on the battlefield. And Arjuna takes that moment to instruct his charioteer to drive the chariot into that empty space between the opposing armies. Arjuna says to Krishna, drive my chariot and stop between the two armies so that I can see these warriors whom I am about to fight, drawn up and eager for battle. I want to look at the men gathered here, ready to do battle service for Dhritashrastras, I don't know how to pronounce that for sure, their Tarashtra's evil-minded son. And it's there, in between the armies, that Arjuna and Krishna have this discussion, which is the Bhagavad Gita, the discussion about the nature of humans and the nature of divine and the nature of reality. This is an obvious picture of duality. The image is of a vast battlefield with men and horses and armor and weapons lined up against each other. These two armies are described as one good and one bad. The middle space is an empty space, which is normally called in, in battles, no man's land. So you could say that this space is, is no self. And it's in this space that we explore and we discover what we really are and who we really are. So if we knew nothing else about the conversation between Arjuna and Krishna, we would already know a lot. This imagery reminds me of the description of God in the Hebrew Bible. God is in the Holy of Holies located in the empty space between the two cherubim above the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. That's a picture of duality, with the true God pictured occupying the space between. 
In the Hebrew scripture, it is the high priest who represents all of Israel who comes into this Holy of Holies once a year and speaks the unspeakable name of God, which is Yahweh, which is, you could say, the Hebrew equivalent of the Sanskrit Aum. What also comes to mind is the opening scene of the creation story in Genesis. In that story, in Genesis 1, God creates the temporal, physical world by dividing. He separates light from darkness, the heavens from the earth, the waters from the waters, so that dry land appears. And in that dry land, he places humans and all living things, which are themselves dualities male and female. This space in the midst of duality is the setting for all the rest of the Bible, for Bible history, starting with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which itself is a symbol of duality. These are just a few of the parallels that come to mind. The third picture I see in the Gita is the two characters having a discussion. Even though lots of subjects are discussed, the main topic, the overarching theme, is whether or not Arjuna should fight. Seeing the faces of his kinsmen, whom he knows by name, lined up for battle, he cannot bring himself to kill those people that he knows. So he decides to lay down his bow and become the ancient equivalent of a conscientious ob objector. That scene of Krishna, of, of Arjuna rather, laying down his bow and then at the end of the book picking it up again is a powerful picture. The ethical problem of war has been a struggle in my life ever since I was a, a young man during the time of the Vietnam War. And over the years, my approach to this has fluctuated between an ethic of nonviolence and sometimes just war theory. But I keep coming back to nonviolence, to the example of the 20th century nonviolent civil rights and anti war movements. This subject was what was raised for me once again as I was reading the Gita, and I sympathized with Arjuna, who himself was in this internal struggle trying to figure out what he was going to do. Arjuna, I mean Mahatma Gandhi, who was who, who revered the Bhagavad Gita, was also inspired by Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and his his nonviolence. It was what inspired Gandhi's nonviolent campaign for national independence for India. Yet, in the Gita, the figure of God in the person of Krishna argues and persuades Arjuna to fulfill his duty as a member of the warrior caste and fight. And Gandhi, reading this and realizing this, has to conclude the Gita does not decide for us. It's interesting to get into Gandhi's head at the, at the end of Mitchell's translation of the, the Bhagavad Gita. There's a chapter written by Mahatma Gandhi on this very subject. Reading the Bhagavad Gita has been a way for me to contemplate how far a person of faith, a person of spirituality, especially a follower of Jesus, can engage in earthly battles. For now, my pacifist roots are prevailing. In Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, Violence seems like the only, nonviolence seems like the only long-term solution. Violence just sows the seed of future violence. 
An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth only makes the whole world blind and toothless, it is said. Sometimes that's attributed to Gandhi. But my dentist says that I don't have too many tooth, teeth to spare. Yet while reading the Gita, I can also see how all wars that have ever been fought and are, and are fought now, and right now as I'm recording this, we're, we're in this tense time in the, in the Ukraine where, where Russia is, is threatening to invade the, the Ukraine. I see that in all the wars. We just finished the Afghanistan war not too long ago. I see all those wars in the larger context of non-duality. I see that the dramas of dualities are always happening within this whole one space of non-duality. And that is true no matter what decision that we, as seemingly individual selves, make about that during our lifetimes. No matter what decision we make as little selves, we have to realize that we are the larger self that includes all those little selves. There is, you could say, a non-dual space, which is what we are, within, within which all these opposing forces of yin and yang fight. The eternal self, this non-dual self, is in all humans, on both sides of all issues and all wars. The eternal self holds all of human history in all the universe within itself. And that eternal self is what we are. And that eternal self cannot die, which is the message that comes across clearly in the Bhagavad Gita. That is the non-dual message that this Christian hears in the Gita. And that is it for today. Grace and peace to you.